The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Joining us will be uh, Juan Martinez. He's the prosecutor in that uh, trial. And he's written a new book, um, well, it's fairly new, called Conviction. And it's the untold story of putting Jody Arias behind bars. Uh, thanks very much for being on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. So, um, uh, quite, a, quite a trial. Um, what, what made you actually write the book? Um, well, there's um, been many uh, things that have been said about that. Uh, maybe some of it uh, people have thought it was perhaps a chance to even the score or something like or, or perhaps uh, take uh, some liberties uh, with things. But um, the reason I actually decided to write book is that it, uh, I think it's an interesting story. Um, I, I know that a lot. Is, there are a lot of materials out there, and um, and uh, I thought that what I had to offer was interesting about something that somebody had already seen, because everybody had seen what had happened during the trial. I thought that I could provide sort of the backstory, what what was actually going on in my head, what why did the things that I did, why I took the approach that I did with regard to certain witnesses, and so uh, I think that it, that it was something that uh, people might find interesting. Also, there was a I guess a sort of a teaching function to it. Um, uh, because uh, we we are so inundated with uh, shows on television and that sort of thing, and um, that's really not how it works. Uh, and so I sort of wanted to to show people that uh, how it works and how you can sort of uh, within that system um, sort of uh, try to present a case the best way possible using 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 what's available to you uh, through the uh, court uh, procedures. So you yourself, did you learn something from writing the book? Uh, yes, I learned how difficult it was. It's, it's <laughs> trite to say, but uh, it is so incredibly difficult to write a book, and uh, it took many, many hours. And there was a lot of uh, choices in in the words that went into it, and so it uh, it I, I can't emphasize enough and, and and how difficult and how much respect that I have for authors. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, now, when you were writing the book and stuff, did you ever look back and ask yourself? Um, if you could have done something differently in the trial itself, um, I would like to think that that, that I would have said that. But I'm, I, I think that I'm, I'm I'm experienced enough to know that um, if I would to have done that, there are so many decisions that are made on a daily basis in trials that I I would it would have made me crazy. And so I once I've done the decision, once I've made the decision. And I've done whatever it is that I've done. I'm, I move on because uh, I, 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 the thought of going back and, and looking at all the things uh, would not have been very productive, and I probably would be still be mired uh, in in the past and and, and probably be depressed because <laughs> uh, all of us, uh, uh, you know, we think we're doing the right thing and we think we sound pretty smart at the time we're doing it, but. But sometimes, uh, you know, and, and and looking back, we might not, but we, we might not think we do the same things. But given all those circumstances and all the pressures that are going on, uh, it's probably the right thing that you're doing at that point. So, no, I can't say that I go back and, and look at things. How has the reaction been for the book? Uh, have you been finding uh, pretty positive overall, or any sort of negative bites? I would like to say, well, it has been. Uh, Positive overall. I, I don't know of, of uh, any negatives that are out there. I, I haven't read anything that says anything negative about uh, the substance of the book. So I'm inclined to uh, be an optimist and say, well, then most people really must have liked it and must have liked the story that I told. Uh, obviously, you know, if somebody doesn't write the book, they're not going to come up to you and say that was not a very good book. But you know, there, there are critics that do that and. Uh, uh, I know that there was uh, at least some concern with the book before it came out before uh, people knew what was out there and I know in, so that in terms of criticism and I may start with that I mean the local newspaper uh, may have been very critical and I emphasize the very uh, but that was before they knew what was in it and uh, since the book was uh, published uh, there hasn't been a comment at all about it so I take it that, uh, that, that that's, that's sort of uh, a sign from them that, uh, that they must have uh, found that it was a lot better than they thought, and they really didn't have much to quibble with. No news is good news. 
Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> if we talk to politicians, maybe they, they'll say any news is good, but for us, no news is good news. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's better to be not the focus, especially with social media. Uh, how, how do you feel about all that? Like, uh, you know, um, we get this a lot, and, and uh, with trials being tele- televised, and uh, do, do you feel like it's going to make a change in how you act um, doing your job? No. Um, I, I, when I go into court, I, um, I actually don't even, and I know there are cameras there when I walk in, but I actually don't even think about them. I just do what I normally would do otherwise. But, but I do agree with you that, that social media, which is part of the cameras, that sort of thing, is a, just a powerful force out there that, um, that, um, that, that, that has a strong influence on the opinions of the public. And uh, I'm mindful of that. And uh, so it's, it's a situation where um, you, you just, um, it's not that you have to watch yourself. It's, it's a situation that you have to comport yourself with courtesy uh, in all the situations out there, but that's not anything that you shouldn't do anyway. So, um, uh, if someone's being a miscreant and misbehaving, uh, perhaps uh, you know it's, it's it's not something that they don't do otherwise. So, I find that it's usually positive. Uh, you know, uh, there is some misinformation out there, like there is with any other media, but uh, but it is a powerful force and it's one to be reckoned with. Well, I was thinking more. Uh, you know, when um, you must have to avoid. Uh, comedy shows and stuff because I mean uh, you know you look at just that series with the uh, O.J. Simpson trial and you think about Marsha Clark and and them showing nude shots of her and and Saturday Night Live making a skit of Judge Ito and things Um, if that happens to you I I would think that's going to affect you yeah, there are nudes of me out there. Because <laughs> I don't know about them. <laughs> That's the first you've heard. <laughs> not, 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 not to make light of it, but yes, absolutely. If if that stuff were, were happening out there, I I obviously would take it to heart, and and it would affect. Uh, it, it would certainly affect the way I see things, and uh, I can only imagine what uh, she must have gone through. Because I do remember at the time that uh, those Polaroids, I think it was, yeah. well, it seems like uh, it might have been like an ex-husband or something. That, uh, but I don't know exactly who it was, but uh, yeah. yes, I, I can imagine that. And uh, and uh, with Judge Ito, I, I mean, I don't, it, it, I don't know um, if, if, it was, uh, if it was something that was positive or, or, or negative. I do remember uh, one of the programs had something called the Dancing Edos. Yeah, I thought that was particularly that was particularly <laughs> funny. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know what if they were mean spirited or people who just were just interested. So, I would have taken it, and if they would have done that, as people just being interested in what I do. So, you think it should be televised? Then, then you're okay with. It. I, I do believe that uh, that uh, that that um, that trials should be televised. Because a lot of the times what we get from the media is filtered. Uh, I, I, no, no matter what somebody tries to tell you, that they are as accurate as they possibly can be, there is always a slant, uh, unless you actually see it for yourself and you can agree or disagree with, what's, with what is being said about it. So I do believe that that has a tendency to, if it's televised, to show people exactly what was going on. Uh, if there was a crime, they can make up their mind what, what they think about the crime, and rather than ha- having somebody else tell you, it's like watching the movie. Uh, I think I would prefer to watch the movie than to have somebody tell me what the movie was about. Yeah. And so when you were first brought into the case, um, did you th- know it was going to be kind of what it became? Did you think of uh, what did you think about that case when you first went to the scene? Um, I knew I, I didn't. I knew I can. I guess use the word that I knew it wasn't going to be a big sort of national kind of media spectacle. I, 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 I knew it wasn't, but um, uh, and, and as time went by, it, it appeared that, uh, that the attention to it waned, except that uh, periodically uh, Jody Arias would go on, for example, one of the news magazines, and then the interest would be peaked again. And, and so she would do things that would cater to the media's interest, and uh, some of it was very fallacious, and so, uh, of course, that also brought in more people into looking at it. But no, I didn't think it was going to be what it actually turned out to be. Uh, even on the day of uh, jury selection or at the beginning, I didn't. I really didn't think much was going to be made out of it because uh, people's memories have a tendency to lessen with time. And so I thought, well, it's just going to be one of those things that maybe 
uh, the, the, the press will be here for opening statement, but after that, well, people will kind of just lose interest. But what was different about this case is that the case wore, wore on. People became much more interested. I mean, it was it, right there during the cross-examination of, of her. There was it, it, The case was at a fever pitch, and uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that, perhaps probably because I haven't been paying attention, but... It, it, it was um, it was something that I don't think that uh, that I ever anticipated, and it's not anything that I ever thought that uh, it could it could it could be that interesting to people. Well, that must have been uh, something when 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 she was doing all the different televised, and you were getting prepped for the uh, trial, um, and she's on forty eight hours, and she's singing, and all. Stuff. How <laughs> did that make you feel? Like, what what did you take in and take to the trial with that? Well, I was grateful <laughs> she did that. I mean, she, without, unknowingly, she was helping me. Because I, I during the trial, I, I used some of those statements. And also it gave me a view into her personality and the, how it was that she would handle questions when she was asked. I remember specifically one question that was asked by the, uh, by the interviewer in the 48 Hours about the camera and the images on the camera. And we all know that they included some nude uh, portrayals of, of her and Travis involved in sex. And that she sort of smiled. And I remember thinking, my goodness, that, that looks like the Mona Lisa, the way she kind of smiled sort of seductively and turned it into a positive and said, well, you know, adults can be involved in intimate moments that are supposed to be kept between the two of us. And it, or something like that. And I remember thinking, she's actually making it seem uh, so very positive for her. And so I knew that. Uh, from that point on, that uh, if I was going to ask her a question, and there were, uh, you know, the, there were uh, two alternatives, she would come up with a third, the one that would benefit her the most. Yeah, she uh, she's quite the storyteller, and and the defense strategy. Now that must have been kind of a was that a surprise? Like even they opened up with sex right in the opening statement, and they kind of continued through, and that seemed to be their um, regular message. Um, was that a dis- yeah. was that kind of a surprise? Do you expect something different? No, I kind of expected it, and uh, I, I've got to say that um, sex is a funny thing. I mean, uh, it uh, if 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 it's there all the time, it has a callousing effect, so that uh, it has a tendency to, to to make it not quite so stark. So when she kept proclaiming that she was victimized sexually, and then went into great detail about it, it got to the point where obviously you could only talk about it so much and then you're not shocked anymore yeah. and then and then the pendulum begins to swing the other way and you say well if it was so bad why didn't you just leave why did you have to drive all the way from my uh and it take a couple of days to go see him just to have sex if it was so bad and so i think that because of that i think that um yes initially it was shocking but i think that in the long run uh, perhaps that worked to my advantage yeah, I, I would think you know, and, and but the telephone calls and and the you know just the whole idea that they were trying to, um, I guess, victimize. I don't know if that's the right word, but Travis, they were trying to make him sound like a pedophile, and he was you know masturbating to little boys and all this stuff. Um, I, I, how was that to deal with? That was difficult. I mean, it is shocking to hear that the first time that you hear it. And I and uh, I actually um, my position was that uh, that the phone call should not be played. I actually objected to it, and it was it was their strategy, and that that it should be heard. So it was admitted over my objection, uh, and I I indicated that well, I, my view was that perhaps it, it, there was no place for it because it was talking about events that occurred before the killing, and it, and it, and it, it did involve very private moments. I will say that that was incredibly uncomfortable to hear, um, especially that when 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 we heard the supposed climax by Miss Arias. I mean, that was that was that was just uncomfortable because it was so loud and it just seemed so out of place to be be played in a, in a, in a murder case. So um, I, again, I, I I don't know exactly. See, they they the defense knew what their strategy was, and, and for them it was important. And so. Uh, and so they felt that that was the best thing to do to play that. So I, again, it's difficult to hear, and uh, it was very difficult for me to deal with the allegations of pedophilia, um, because obviously then 
the, perhaps the jury might say, well, this kind of individual perhaps might have had it coming to him, and that would have made the case a little bit that made the case a little bit more difficult. And she she did say that that's what uh, he was engaging in, and so. Yes, that that allegation was one of the most difficult things to deal with. Um, I know that throughout the pro, throughout the trial, they played uh, were not played, but they they uh, had an instant message where he, where he called her things, including a three hole wonder, and that was difficult to deal with. But but I I didn't feel like I had a need to apologize for that. Those are his words, and that's what he said. But the reason you at least look behind the words and wonder, well, why did he say it? In, in that particular message, he indicated that uh, she had lied to him about something. We don't know exactly what, and that, that caused him to react. So I, I never try to excuse anything. I just try to explain things and show the jury that perhaps some of the things weren't true and other things, uh, perhaps they could place them in context. Well, what did we know about Travis Alexandra before the murder? Like, what, what kind of person and, and, and what did we know about him? Well, he held himself out uh, to be a religious man, uh, and um, part of the religion uh, required that uh, men and women remain chaste until they uh, are married, and he held himself out to be that. Um, obviously, he wasn't, and uh, would it be harsh to say that, that uh, he was being a bit hypocritical? Perhaps. Perhaps, but, uh, you know, that, that's between him and his conscience. But other than that, I mean, everybody would say that, 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 that he was a very religious man and that he worked for this organization known as PPL, Prepaid Legal. But that was about all that we knew about him. Uh, and, I mean, that, his reputation uh, in the community was one uh, of a good guy, kind of, that, uh, that, that was involved in religion. Yeah. And how did he uh, come across Jody? Like, where did they meet? Um, he actually was uh, working or, or work as a subcontractor working with PPL, the prepaid legal, and they had a convention in, of all places, Las Vegas uh, in September of 2006, and, uh, and uh, she happened to be attending it. And uh, they, the way she tells the story, uh, it was like Prince Charming and the crowds parted as he walked up to her and strode up to her and you know, extended his hand and say hi, and ex- introduced himself and said, "Hi, I'm Travis Alexander." She portrayed it somewhat uh, like a, actually kind of like a Cinderella kind of thing, uh, where it was it was it was more than just the meeting. Well, yeah, you have to wonder how much is fantasy, you know. Uh, in it appeared mind. that a lot of it was fantasy, yeah. and, uh, and 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 like with all fantasy, I mean, uh, I understand that if, if she thinks it's a fantasy, it's difficult for any individual to to meet that fantasy that's being created by another person and so he didn't I mean that's one of the things that was probably problematic with the relationships to start out with he was never going to meet that standard that you had for him of being this sort of punch charming kind of guy Both people don't exist we're all human we all have our negative sort of things that we do because that is just being human and uh, maybe he he didn't um Maybe he didn't uh, come across the way she really wanted him in every single aspect of their life. Well, and he sort of um, didn't want to, uh, I don't want to say she wasn't good enough to be married, but he was looking for someone that had a different image. Um, actually, he he just, um, he it wasn't that he was, I don't see it as him looking for somebody with a, with a different image. It just came across as him seeing that they were constantly arguing and he constantly was not able to meet her expectations. Uh, I, I know that uh, one of the things that came out was that uh, in, in items that were disclosed was that she was very critical of everybody. Uh, everybody had to meet Jody Arias' standard. And I suspect that uh, as that goes on, that would great. I know that the word that is used um, it almost has biblical proportions when you use it, but it, or, or connotations when you use it is that nagging, and so it appears that she was somewhat of a nag because she was always criti- critical of people. Uh, even her ex-boyfriend Matthew McCarthy said that he was, she was always critical of him. That that seemed to be what she was, and so um, if she was that critical with him, do this, do that, don't do that, um, that gets tiresome, and and it's not so much that. 
she wasn't meeting the image. It was just somebody that you just don't want to spend time with. I can't imagine many, many men or women wanting to be with somebody that constantly complains about their conduct. Right, yeah. It becomes a bit much. When, do you, when did she first become a suspect? Uh, we, we being the police, did not have any suspects to start with. But from the, the top, from that next day, from the morning of the next day, her name kept coming up as somebody that the police needed to look at. And, um, she, one of the more interesting aspects of the case is while the police are out at the scene, she's calling them to try to get information. Um, they thought, well, it's just an old, old girlfriend, ex-girlfriend. Sure, we'll talk to her. We're not going to get anything out of it. But as the, the case started to build, um, there were no other suspects. It just seemed like she was the only one that had an axe to grind with him or had a problem with him uh, that they began to focus on her. And then um, when they looked at the, um, when they were able to obtain the photographs from the camera, that's when she became a suspect because they could see that she was the one that actually had killed him. So it sort of progressed, and within about a month, uh, they were they knew that she was the person who had actually killed him. Yeah. But what do you think the most important um, pieces of evidence were? The camera. The camera was the most important piece because that was time stamped. So it showed that sometime around 1.30 in the afternoon on the day that she killed him, um, that uh, June 4th, that, uh, that they were engaged in some intimate moments. And after that, uh, uh, he was taking a shower sometime around 5.30 in the afternoon. And while he was taking a shower, something happened because we have a picture of the ceiling. And it was an inadvertent photograph, an accidental photograph, the ceiling right above the shower. So taking photographs of him in the shower, see, we see the top of the shower, uh, something happening. And uh, a short time later, within minutes, you can actually see her foot uh, uh, as he's laying face up with blood stirring from his uh, neck. Uh, and then you see her kind of dragging him down the hallway. So at that point... Um, uh, I mean, that, that was the most important thing because that's it's sort of the glue that held the case together. And so what, what items did you actually keep out of the trial? Um, I'm not sure that I, I even remember what kind of items I chose not to highlight. There is so, there's such a mountain of evidence that, uh, for me, when, when I say that I chose to keep things out, it's because of the boredom factor mostly. Um, you have all these people that uh, are members of society and jury, and, and they, I, I am reluctant to waste their time by bringing in everything that's associated with the case. I could have brought in, for example, just as an example, not only the first responding officer, but I could have brought in the second responding officer and the third responding officer that night to show you what they saw. But I didn't need to do that. I, needed to, I only brought in one who sort of summarized for everybody what, what they saw. So there were a lot of things like that. And I, my, my view is that uh, I tried to tell a story. And if you try to tell the story over and over, uh, the same aspect, then it becomes boring. So there were many things that uh, I didn't introduce because I thought that um, they were already covered. So what was your strategy then for the trial? Like what did you have um, in mind? Well, the strategy was that I, it included the fact that I knew she was going to take the witness stand. So my my uh, case in chief was tailored just to show that she actually did it. And, and I, it was a no frill sort of uh, approach to it. I, I remember that there was a bit of criticism and some surprise when people said that I went through it very quickly and then I got through the witnesses very quickly. It was because I knew that the showdown, if you will, the case was where I was going to prove or not prove the case was going to be during the cross-examination. So everything that I did was pointed towards that cross-examination. And uh, yes, I was able to show that she killed him. Yes, I was able to show the date when she killed him, what she did afterwards, what the, what the medical examiner said the victim died from, the stab wounds, the slashing of the throat, and the, the shot to the uh, temple. But all of that, I knew, uh, was just sort of setting the stage what was going to come, which is that she was going to take the uh, stand. She had to because she was claiming that he had attacked her and that really her defense was that, um, you know, there are some people because they are pedophiles, because they are verbally and physically abusive, uh, because of that, perhaps they should believe her and acquit her because it was self-defense or at the, at the most or at the least they should give her a less included offense of uh, manslaughter. 
So that, that's that's sort of how the presentation of the case went. So how what did you think of her? I guess that's it's kind of a broad <laughs> quasi way of saying it, but just that. I know a lot of people at the time were saying that you were very bullish and aggressive, and then at the same time, there was um, she was very intelligent. She was very well put together, and she challenged you in things. Um, she, like she was very quick on her feet. Like uh, you know, when you would say, "Oh, how could you forget?" You just said it, and she was like, "Well, it's your tone, and you're kind of you're like <laughs> Travis. You know, you're being a, you're an abuser. You know, to, she was very quick to come up with things like that, and and." Uh, what was your assessment of her? Um, I, th- I think he hit the nail on the head. She's she's intelligent, very smart, and you and I and I was fortunate that I did not underestimate her. I can I can foresee a situation where I go in thinking, well, I've got her, you know, with these three different stories. It's going to be an easy kind of thing where I just show the stories to the jury, and then the jury's going to automatically disbelieve anything she has to say. It wasn't like that. Because she was so um, conversant, and she was able to come across so well uh, on direct examination that if I, if I would have restricted myself to that, that uh, there may have been a chance that uh, she might have been acquitted or maybe on a secluded defense. But um, what I think of her is that she's very conversant. I think that she's intelligent and that uh, uh, she could come across well uh, and did come across well to the jury at some point. But that was her undoing, because when it came time to answer the real difficult questions, that's when I showed that uh, uh, she could be deceitful. And, for example, saying, well, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, fill up the three gas, I didn't have three gas cans. Well, then how is it that in, say, in Salt Lake City, you filled up the three gas cans? At least that's what the receipt showed. And she had no answer for that, other than to look you right in the face and look me right in the face and say, I was never in Salt Lake City when I had the receipts to prove that she that she was. So I, I guess I would just say that she was somebody that was very intelligent and very conversant. Yeah, she it played like a movie, like almost like a script. Like it was, it was yeah. you know. She I, did come across as a victim. I mean, part of it, she did come across as a victim. And that was probably a very, uh, that was a big challenge, right? Um, oh, if, oh, yeah. Do you think that's why she didn't get the death penalty? I don't even know why she didn't get the death penalty. I, you know, that would require me to know what went on in the deliberations, and uh, I don't really concern myself with that. Um, I mean, they have the reasons, and uh, I, I accept that and I moved on. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 like everything else. I mean, the, the the jury looked at all of the mitigating circumstances and decided that uh, they could not reach a a, um, a decision. I know that uh, the majority of them, at least in the last trial. Eleven to one thought that that something was appropriate. As to what what went on back there, I'm really not sure, and so I really probably can't even comment. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. It's tough to to go back on that. What well, now? Your your strategy for premeditation. Um, what what were the main points? Um, one of the things that um, that I tried to show to the jury was that premeditation does not necessarily have to include planning even though this case had a lot of planning. The premeditation could be a thought to kill somebody, and it doesn't have to be preceded by an inordinately long time. It just has to be time enough to allow the person to think about it. And because in this case she used two implements of death, she brought a backup, if you will, the gun. That showed that she was thinking of killing them, and the implements themselves showed that she wanted him dead because... That's what a gun is designed for. It's designed to, they use it in wars to, to kill the other people. That, that's, what it's, that's what it's used for. And that's what she brought. Additionally, a knife, if you stick it in somebody, people know that that's going to cause some severe damage and could also kill the individual. So the fact that she used two items was part of the premeditation. Additionally, the fact that she, that she inflicted three mortal wounds, the, the, the one to the chest, which disabled him, uh, then slashing his throat and then finally putting the, 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 the bullet in his head that also showed that she wanted to kill him and that took time, approximately two minutes. So that's, that's enough premeditation. But on top of that, if you wrap that around with what she did before, for example, staging the burglary so she could get the gun, driving all that time, doing, uh, renting a car that was white rather than red so the police wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, pick her out. She, or wouldn't stop her on the road. Um, 
taking the license plates off the car so that when she parked it, uh, she wouldn't be recognized, changing her care color on the way so that perhaps she also wouldn't be recognized. All of those things go to the planning stages of it, which are incorporated in, in the premeditation. And so it, it was a strong case for a premeditated uh, first-degree murder, I thought, the way I presented it. Now, have you heard anything from her um, since the book came out? No, not at all. And uh, I would, and I would not expect her to get in contact with me. I, I mean, the case is uh, is on appeal, and and uh, and I've never, in all the cases that I've ever heard prosecuted, ever heard from the defendant once once the verdict was in. So it, I did not expect to hear from her, and it's not unusual for me not to hear from her. Yeah, and so now the appeal. Do you think that um, she has a chance? Well, I don't know anything about the appeal. I don't know what the grounds are. I, I do know that um, it's going to be a, a little bit... Well, the only thing that I'll say with regard to that, the appeal is that one of the things that she has to deal with is that she admitted that she killed him. So um, um, I, I don't know exactly how she would... I, I don't know exactly how she would deal with that aspect of it, uh, how she would style it and say... Well, I, you know, I, the jury. I guess you'll have to say that the jury was wrong. But I'm. I mean, that's not that's not my area of expertise, and I really don't even know what See, their grounds are. You're so. not really follow. You don't really follow the case. Once it's done, it's done, and you just sort of move on. Well, that's true. Then that's and and uh, though the appeal is handled by uh, the Arizona Attorney General's office, and all of my cases, once I'm done with them at the trial level, they're handled up there. So, so I don't really know what what happens to them after that. So they don't really stay with you. Like you're not really. Um you don't really follow it as in uh, what happens to people. And it doesn't stay with you if you don't get the, uh, let's say, the, the, the outcome that you wanted. Well, it, they don't stay with me whether I do or not. I, don't, I just don't follow them uh, because I have other things to think about, other things to do. Uh, it, you know, even in those cases where I do get the death penalty, rarely do I ever get contacted by the Office of the Attorney General. They do their job. I do mine. And uh, um on, a, on the other cases where the death penalty was imposed, I, I really couldn't even tell you at what point they are in the in the process. All I know is that I I did what I do, and once it moves on, that's somebody else's uh, thing. That's somebody else's, uh, uh, um, I guess, cup of tea to drink. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, mine, I I have other, I have other things that I'm doing now. I have other cases that I'm actively prosecuting. Well, but that's good. That's good. It is not not affecting you. That's great. Uh, right. It, 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 these don't stay with me. Whether it's good or bad, they don't stay with me. I, I like I said, even even with regard to the Monday morning quarterbacking, I, I don't even think about them. I, I know that I did the best that I could, and uh, and then I just moved on. So what uh, now in the in the evidence here? Um, what? How are you able to prove, like, uh, wasn't it kind of a, a hard thing to do, like, when you take Jody being uh, pretty small, and uh, I don't want to say Jamira, but with that appeal, and how, was it, you know, her killing Travis, who was much bigger and, and, and you know, more of a strong guy, um, wasn't that kind of a hard uphill thing to do? Yeah, and, and I, I'll even add to what you said, and that's how difficult it was that uh, cases in, involving the claim of self-defense are the most difficult, and that's what she claimed. And the reason that they're the most difficult is that normally or usually there are only two people to the event, to the killing. Uh, one of them is dead, and so you're left with the story of the other individual. And in this case, not only was I left with the story of the individual, but I was left with an individual who was very conversant, and as you you actually pointed out, demure, Look somewhat like the victim, soft spoken, uh, didn't look like she knew how to handle a knife or a gun. And so, yes, that was, that was very difficult to overcome. And, uh, the way to overcome it, which is what I mentioned before, is I pointed to the cross examination to show that even though she possessed all those qualities or said all these things, she absolutely was the person that, that did it. And in fact, there were some flashes of anger during the cross examination. She was evasive. So to the point that, uh, that, given what the verdict, given what the outcome was, the jury didn't believe what she had to say. What was the actual evidence? Now, we, we were asked this a lot. Um, we had uh, Kirk Nurmi on before. Um, and, but mm-hmm. but it's about the, um, the um, being shot and having the neck sliced. How do you know which came first? Uh, my, um, my statements with regard to that are based on what the... Medical examiner says um, 
he indicated that uh, in a young person like Mr. Alexander, the brain is uh, very close to the to the shell, if you will, and that that shot, if it went in the skull that way, would have struck the brain and would have immediately disabled Mr. Alexander. If that would have disabled him, he would not have been able to have the defensive wounds to the left hand, uh, where he, uh, where um, and he did have them where he grabbed the knife. So uh, it was the medical examiner's opinion that the stab wound was uh, first, and that it was followed by the the uh, slashing of the throat, and then the shooting in the face. Um, and that's an opinion that uh, I know there was an interview year approximately a year, maybe a year and a half, some some time before the trial, where he. The only time that he's ever been interviewed, that's what he said. So uh, I'm just going with what the medical examiner said. Uh, yeah. so I, I don't have a medical background, and I don't pretend to stand up and say, well, Mr. Person who actually did the examination, you're wrong. <laughs> I, I follow what he, what he tells me. Yeah. <laughs> so as if I went to the doctor to, to, for a medical ailment, I, don't, I, don't, I, I try not to question what they tell me. Yeah. Uh, and what's the, Now, what do we know about Jody f- before the Travis. Do you have any information on uh, what her past indicated? Like, uh, did, was she doing this kind of thing before? No, there's no indication that uh, there was any, um, other than perhaps, according to her, uh, kicking holes in walls, breaking windows, that sort of thing. There really wasn't any indication that uh, there was any violence in her past. And Perhaps there was some indication that her relationships were never successful because it seemed that uh, she would go out of her way to sabotage them. For example, with the first one, uh, Bobby Watt is uh, one of the things that she said was that uh, he was on a computer in the library. She went back, and according to her, she was just able to get on, even though there's some sort of password protection associated with it. So she was able to find things. She did sort of the same thing that Travis went on his computer. And with regard to the individual Matthew McCartney in between there, uh, she got an inkling or a feeling that uh, he was messing around. And as she was working, just fortuitously, two people that were working with Mr. McCartney came in and said, we took a vote. It was kind of a democratic kind of people, you know. They came to her and said, we took a vote, and we think you should know that he's seeing somebody else. So uh, the only thing in her past was what she presented, and, and it indicated that perhaps she she had a hard time staying in a relationship. Yeah, and and the other boyfriend was the one that lent her a gas can. Well, that, yeah, that was uh, that was the latest export. And Daryl Brewer, uh, he she called him in at the end of May and asked to borrow some gas cans. He had two five gallon gas cans, and uh, he lent them to her. So um, that was sort of what uh, helped me uh, to show and look and find a third gas can. So it sort of. It helped unravel um, her story, and it helped unravel the the idea that perhaps she would be victim in this case, because that showed that she actually planned to go all the, through the state of Arizona without having to fill up, so that she could subsequently say, "Well, I was never in Arizona. You can't put me there. There are no receipts. There's no gas receipts." And so, yes, the truth that there are no gas receipts, but there are three five-gallon gas cans, a total of fifteen gallons extra, which is which would give her enough uh, fuel to get through the state of Arizona without stopping at a gas station. And was that the same boyfriend? Did she? She went right to a new guy right after the murder, didn't she? Um, it, well, after she killed Mr. Alexander, one of the things that she did is she drove to uh, Salt Lake City and she met uh, uh, or met up with a boy that a young man that she'd never met before, and according to him, they were grinding. I don't know exactly what that means, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to guess, and it had, I know it has sexual connotations. And according to him, again, according to him, she was the one that was kissing him passionately. So, yes, she did go, and then she did engage in some, in some sort of intimacies with uh, this other guy. Wow. You have to wonder what she had planned. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she that, that, again, the word plan, I mean, it showed that she had this plan and she stuck with it. Because if she would have gone straight back to Wairika, it, it, would, it would have looked at because the reason for the trip was to see this other guy, and so if she had bailed out on him, then 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 the reason for the trip would have gone out the window, and she needed that that to support her statement. Yeah, well, and just her renting the car, and didn't she take the license plate off the car? She did. Um, she 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 claimed that uh, it was actually some uh, 
some young men that did it in Southern California that took out both gas cans and did a joke, put, put the back, uh, um, license plate on backwards, but that didn't make any sense. Uh, these skateboarders somehow that uh, walk around doing that and just happen to see her car, and as she's backing up, she just happens to see something on the ground, even though she's not wearing her glasses and can't see, and, but something is glowing, and so she decides to stop to see what's glowing in the dark. It, it just didn't make any sense, and it, and it was clear that she was the person who actually took the license plate off and then put it upside down in the back and then forgot to put the one in front on. Oh, one well, and and she st- the gun. Now we figure that she staged the burglary in, in her mother's house. Was it? Uh, it would be the grandparents. The grandparents, right? Um, she claimed in a conversation of June tenth to the Mesa Police Department that uh, that Mister Alexander did not have any weapons. The only weapons that she claimed he had were his two fists, and so she that meant that she had to have brought a gun with her, a twenty five caliber. And by coincidence, a week or so before this killing, there was a burglary at a place where she was living, her grandparents' home, where only a single item was taken from every room. Uh, I don't know that any burglars that do that, that say we're going to restrict ourselves to a single item per room, but uh, there was only a single item taken from uh, every room, and in, and in one of the rooms, uh, I'm going to call it the gun room, uh, the, there was one item missing, the 20, a 25 caliber handgun, and a 25 caliber casing was found at the scene. So um, she, I, clearly she had to have come up with a gun from somewhere, and, and that's where she got it from her grandparents' home. Now, I noticed quite a bit. Now, um, uh, you tend to work alone in these cases and, and don't have uh, co counsel so to speak. Um, is there a reason for that? Yeah, no one can stand me. <laughs> 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 I'm not easy to get along with. Oh, I, uh, you know, it, it's just that um, it's more of a fault of mine than anything else. I like to make sure that I read and go through everything uh, so that uh, I don't miss anything on cross-examination, for example. And so uh, I know that other people are much more effective doing it the other way. For me, it just works better this way. That, and that uh, and there's there's got to be a sort of a captain of the ship, and somebody has to take responsibility for things and and uh, I guess that's the role that I sort of like to embrace. So now uh, you've made no mention, you, you don't really criticize the defense and uh, don't really mention um, uh, now that, you know, Nermi's putting out books and stuff. Uh, do you have any opinion on that or just stay away from it? I, I, I don't have any opinion. I mean, uh, my view is that um, that I I was... I put the book together because I wanted people to, to hear what I had to say. And uh, I'm not going to be critical of anybody because that's not really what the book is about. It's about the strategy that I undertook. It's not about, you know, uh, being, you know, complimentary of the judge or, or not of the defense attorney. That, that's not what the book is about. And so uh, I, I don't concern myself with that. Additionally, uh, just that's just never been the way I do things. I, I don't... In other cases, I just you know I don't go out of my way to complain about anybody or anything, and it's it's just a better approach for me, and uh, and, it's, and the fact that I don't complain about these defense attorneys, it's just what I do. I just I just don't do that. Do you feel like um, with I don't know if it's just more uh, we're more aware because of social media, but do you feel like there's a lot more of this type of crime going on now? Do you think there's something different in this generation? You know, I've thought about that, and uh, I I have a tendency to believe, and I have no statistical studies to back this up, but it just seems to me that if something horrific happens, it seems that it explodes out there, and it gets out there. And when it gets out there, people talk about how horrific it is and how bad it is, but they always show the person who did it. Right. And it seems like it's an achievement in a, in a sort of negative way. It appears to be an achievement. And um, I think that that's misinterpreted by the people, by the young people perhaps, because uh, I see that a lot more now, or the people that are out there. And so it, they getting your 15 minutes of fame is turning away from accomplishments into something that's negative, things like that. And, and, and so... Because of social media, 
they achieve their 15 minutes of fame, but it's for a negative reason. Additionally, when you do achieve something uh, of, of note, it just seems that it's almost not worth it because somebody is always there to criticize, you know, those that can do and those that can't go out of the way to criticize. So there's sort of a, it's a sort of a two-edged sword. Yes, when somebody does something bad, people come out of the woodwork and, and say, oh, that's really horrible, but he was such a good neighbor. And when you do something good, it's almost not worthwhile because people then start criticizing. Oh, yeah, he wrote a great book, but, you know, look what it's about kind of thing. So, yes, I do think that um, it does seem to be on the up- uptick, and I'm not quite sure why, and it saddens me, and I worry about it uh, because I just don't know what's going to happen next. But it just seems that, that you hear about these horrific things like one right after the other. Yeah, and, and it's a weird time because... Um like Jody Arias is on, you know, she's on Facebook, she's on Twitter, and she's on, you know, she's been put away for life. You know, it's just, it seems weird that she can just uh, tweet out things now. Well, it seems that uh, she has people that are tweeting out on her behalf, and I mean, it doesn't stop. I mean, she was just recently in the, in, on the cover of a magazine uh, where, where they claim that she's going to get married. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> other than I did what I read on the magazine. Uh, she's on the cover that uh, she wants to get married and apparently have a family. So again, that's a situation where, where somebody who has done something negative, and not only did the jury say find her guilty of committing first degree murder by admission, she did. In other words, she admitted doing it. She still keeps getting all this press, and so perhaps the young people, or perhaps people that are much more impressionable, will say, "Well, I want some of that." And the way to do it is to go out and do something horrific. Yeah, you'll get a lot more following. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, it does seem that way, doesn't it? You know, I can get a million That's followers right. if I go out and butcher someone. I just, it just seems <laughs> it seems kind of bizarre, um, but that's probably the my age speaking. Right. I mean, what, when was the last time that we actually there were a lot of accolades for somebody who achieved something great? You, you just don't hear that. What you always hear is the negative stuff, yeah. and so it seems like achievement for its own uh, achieving something uh, it isn't something that is going to be valued in the society, and perhaps. Uh, that's something that uh, should be, I don't know. Uh, well, when somebody true. achieves something, I think it, it's something that that, that that people should be complimented for. It's true. I mean, uh, you know, we're showing on our, you know, our headline feature of news was, you know, Kim Kardashian posing with her butt right. on, a, on, a, on, a, <laughs> on a magazine and is there too much oil. At the same time, we're landing on a moving comet, but... Right, isn't that incredible? That the, what gets the, the uh, it's incredible that what what actually garners the uh, the uh, headlines. Yeah, and, that, uh, I always shake my hand when I see that. Uh, it's just. Uh, do you think the justice system is is is? I hear so many people complaining about the justice system, and and some people saying it's a legal system. It's not about justice, and it's about politics and money and uh, whoever you know. If you have enough money, you'll get. Uh, um, you'll get off on things that you don't. Like, you hear all this stuff. What do you feel about the American justice system? I, I think it's the best system that has ever been invented, and it sounds like I'm getting uh, on a soapbox on this, but uh, I know that uh, we have people, for example, from Japan, also from Mexico, who come to be educated on our system. It's, I, I don't believe that if you have a lot of money, that you're going to get off or anything like that. I, I don't see it work that way. I've never seen it work that way. Obviously, no system is perfect, and that's something that uh, we all acknowledge. But um, by and large, um, the idea that, that you you get 12 people that uh, are unbiased, that don't know anything about the case, and they're presented the evidence, and they make a decision, and, and uh, that's... Uh, to me, that's, that seems to be a thing of beauty, and it's a thing of symmetry to it. You present it, they do what they're going to do, and then you can walk away with a clear conscience. And so I, I don't see any, but any, any undue influence on the jurors, for example. The media is kept from them. There's no, Both sides have an equal right to make a presentation. So I think that that's something to be uh, so, to aspire to, actually. So, so I don't agree with those people. Yeah. Uh, well, do you feel there's a certain amount of pressure on prosecutors, um, to do, you know, to have a certain percentage of convictions, to do a, a certain amount, is there is there kind of a stat on on your job? 
No, not at all. Um, there is no pressure that way. I think the, the, the pressure comes from, and again, it sounds like I'm being tried, but to do justice. What is justice in this case? Should I offer a plea? Should I not? Well, should this case be charged? Should it not? There is no pressure to, um, to, to have, if you will, notches on your belt. I do know that, uh, I mean, there is a standard that there has to be a reasonable likelihood of conviction before you actually charge someone so that if uh, if, if you don't adhere to that standard, perhaps they may, there may be ethical considerations. But beyond that, uh, there really isn't no one keeping track and saying, you know, come report to me just because you didn't get a, uh, a conviction in this case. We're, so now you're still prosecuting now? You're still doing the same job you were doing before? I did. I am, I, and I'll continue doing it. I just, again, I mean, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, I... I'm putting my actions where my words are, I guess. You know, I'm not just sort of talking about it because I, I keep saying what a great system it is, and it would have been interesting if I'd have left it. I, I like it. I like doing the job so much, and I do see it as as seeking justice. That that I'm, I'm going to stay here for some more years. I don't know how many more years I'm going to be here. I, I can retire now. I'm getting close to 30 years on the job, but I but I still I still feel that it's, it's 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 something that's very rewarding. So I, I haven't left it and don't plan to leave it at any time in the future. So it hasn't really changed what you want to do with the rest of your career? No, no, there have been many, uh, not many, no, but there have been, <laughs> there have been uh, people who have approached me about doing other things and uh, I've thought about them. Uh, I've been approached about running for political office. Obviously I'm thinking about it, but uh, you know, I, I, I sort of like the public service aspect of this. You know, that people complain about the wage and everything, but maybe it isn't what you get in the private sector. But uh, the satisfaction, I think, is unequaled, knowing that at the end of the day, you did the best that you could, and because of what you did, just a small, incredibly small amount of segment of society is a little safer because of what you did. Oh, be careful with the politics. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been pretty wild. There. I'll tell you, it's, it's been pretty wild lately, so I, I don't know. It has. It has, and it, it continues to get more so, especially in the presidential race. Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. I yeah. just, you know, I, I don't know what, I, I can't even comprehend it. It's just, I think it's something we'll look back at. I think it's in a changing process. You know, right, and, and again, maybe you and I can as, as, uh, ascribe that to uh, social media because social media has a lot to do with what's going on, I think. Every little comment is tweeted out, and then there's a response <laughs> in tweeting. And, yeah. and and you don't have to pay for that. That's the thing. See, that's free. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas before, if you wanted to criticize the other guy, maybe the paper would pick it up, maybe they wouldn't, but you probably would end up having to pay. Plus, it was kept quiet. Like now, you know, you've right. got Donald Trump and, and Hillary Clinton twitting back and forth, you know, all the, all the time. Yeah. It's crazy. It's yeah, just, exactly. It's, it's, like, it's, it's real time. <laughs> right. I, I, and, and, and they tweet about things that are per, of a personal nature. Yeah. I really don't care about the size of somebody's hands. Yeah. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know about their... Yeah. Um, about what they're going to do if we're confronted with a real issue like war. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really it's crazy. That's why I don't know if I would touch politics because uh, you know when you jump into that, it's going to be that. So uh, you're kind of uh -huh. you know I think they broke the door down. Now it's going to just keep going. It's not going to stop. Oh yeah, I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you. It's just, uh, I mean, is, is that is this election a harbinger of things to come? I think maybe. So. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because sure. because. Because it is free. It is free. Yeah, it doesn't go back. It goes forward. And when whatever, uh, Donald Trump is kind of, uh, I think he's the first of many, and even Bernie Sanders, in this sort of way. So I think it's just going to keep going. Right. You know, it's not going to It's not going to close down. It's going to keep opening. So, but, uh, and, and, you know, a lot, a lot of um, what, what we see um, from, from uh, the social media is a lot of it has to, is, is the... Um, is the, not necessarily, and again, I don't have the statistics to back it up, but it seems like the minority view has a tendency to be very vociferous, and they're able to get their message out so quickly and in such huge, sort of, reaching such huge audiences that it seems like in the United States there's double the number of people living here than there really are 
given the way that social media presents the issue. Yeah, yeah. A lot more voices going out there. So, you know. Right. Oh, did you ever watch that movie? I was going to ask that about the Travis and Jody thing. That I think it was on Lifetime or W or something. Did you ever watch that? You, you know, the politically correct thing to say to that, and yeah. mentioned about that, would be say, no, I, you know, I was busy, you know, reading, I don't know, Thoreau or something. <laughs> <laughs> of course I watched it. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see. Obviously, I'm curious, like everybody else, to see how it was treated, how the subject was treated. So. Do, well, do, do, you think <laughs> it was, do you think it was, I don't want to say, you don't have to give an opinion, but I was saying, do, do you think that they let... Um, enough of the true facts get into the story or was it kind of a little bit too dramatized um i think it's like everything else that they want to make it interesting uh and i think that uh, they made it you know they, they made it in such a way that and by that time the case wasn't over yet so i can understand kind of why they what they did with it they did um they they did dram- dramatize it a little bit but i think it was you know mostly for the sake of rating so no it wasn't totally accurate uh, especially with the guy that played me i mean he just wasn't tall enough <laughs> <laughs> well that's important you should have no. a choice <laughs> <laughs> no i was not contacted about it but i did watch it yeah oh that's cool well, I'll tell you, it's been yeah. a great, great hour, and um, uh, thanks very much for taking the time. Uh, I'm sure you're busy and uh, talking today with, about the book. Well, well, thank you so much. I appreciate t- talking to you about it. Uh, have a great day. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! <laughs> I'll see you. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. If you're lying to me, I'll be back.